So today was titled PA pressures, RV function, tricuspid valve. We talked some about tricuspid valve last week. So for the sake of time, so you can get both echo and CMR sides on assessing of RV function, we'll try to limit this and we'll try to sort of introduce concepts. And there is a lot of practice to this, so it's not just knowledge base. So the RV is a challenging chamber to think of and to visualize by 2D because its shape is more pyramidal, if you would. It has different parts that you see in different views, and we need to put things together. Um, so what are the things that we can do for the RV? We visualize the RV from the uh, parasternal long axis view. This gets you the RV outflow track. This is the thinnest part of the right ventricle. So if you're thinking of extrinsic compression, where it shows its effect, this is where it shows its effect. RV dilatation when extreme can be shown here. Segmental dysfunction can sometimes be seen in this view. So when you take a look at your paralong, think along these lines. We can also visualize the RV outflow tract and the pulmonic valve. Uh, this is an excellent alignment with the flow through the pulmonic valve to look at pulmonic valve pathology, congenital lesions, acquired lesions in carcinoid that get the pulmonic valve. So remember this view. This is not the only shot we have at the RV outflow tract. The RV inflow is shown down here, and there is the anterior wall and the diaphragmatic wall that sits on the diaphragm. You have the anterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve, the posterior leaflet. You can see the cordial attachments, the pap muscles. And when you think of segmental RV dysfunction, which can happen because of coronary disease and sometimes in patients with arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, this view is an important view because it shows segments you may not see elsewhere. You obviously put color, you want to look at TR, you want to optimize your color scale, align with TR jet to acquire it by continuous wave Doppler. Peristernal short axis view gets you the RA, LA, you look at the interatrial septum, an important uh, structure to interrogate, looking for shunts across the septum. Again, you can see the tricuspid valve. If there is TR, you can align with it nicely. And also you can align to some extent with the RV outflow tract and you can see the bifurcation of the PA. Congenital lesions, all of these views are very critical and should be performed and acquired well. Short axis views gets you the LV and the RV, of course, multiple levels. As you go to the apex, the RV disappears and you can see different segments, the anterior lateral and the inferior wall. The challenge with the RV wall motion from the short axis and the size in the short axis is not infrequently we get oblique cuts. So what you think is the anterior is not always the anterior. And the extent of thickening, even though we're using the axial resolution, is not easily appreciated in some cases. So long story short, the, there are the parasternal views. We have to look at the RV inflow. Remember the RV outflow tract interrogation from several uh, windows. Epical views are also uh, are the cornerstone for looking at the RV size and measuring fractional area change. This is the recommended position. So if you're having an off-axis view, a low parasternal view, this is not the view that you use to perform your measurements. But they are useful views in the sense that you can see the RV free wall and you can see what is happening with it. And again, excellent alignment for TR, tricuspid inflow, looking PA pressures, RA and systolic area and volume from this view. It's a single plane, that's what we have. Upper limits of normal for RV and diastolic and systolic areas, RA and systolic area and systolic volume are dependent on gender. And the 2015 chamber quantification guidelines have these. So for men, it's 39 mLs per meter squared. For RA and systolic volume, for women, it is 33. We'll hear about the RA volumes by CMR later. Um, 
skipping some details about the uh, apical views. The, we have the subcoastal view, another chance to look at the RV. This gets you the RV free wall thickness. Another look at the tricuspid valve, RA, another chance to interrogate the interatrial septum. For patients who do not have good parasternal windows but have subcoastal windows, one can get a very nice alignment with the RV outflow tract. You can see the pulmonic valve and sample that. So it's a skill when of how to sort of navigate through your views in challenging cases to get the info that you want. This is the blood supply of the RV and its different walls. The anterior wall of the RV is supplied by the uh, marginal branch of the right coronary artery. You have the inferior wall supplied by the posterior descending coronary artery. If you look at the septum, the mid and distal septum and distal RV, these are and the moderator band, these are supplied by the LAD. The basal part of the septum here is supplied also by the marginal branch. The RV outflow tract gets its blood supply from the conus branch. You are expected to know the blood supply of the different RV segments. Looking at the RV wall thickness, the best view to get the RV wall thickness is in the subcoastal view. You want to zoom because we are talking about small measurements, so we do not make big errors, and we measure them at end diastole. And this is a nice illustration from the guidelines, the chamber quantify for the RV function guidelines from 2010. What are the measurements that we can take? Say I don't want to do RV and diastolic and systolic area in the apical views. The least you can do is to get that basal diameter of the RV. And then you can also do other measurements midway and then the long axis of the right ventricle. They give you rough indications of the RV size. There is, There are very few studies. The best probably published about two years ago in, in the Journal of the American Society of Echo, showing that this measurement, as well as some measurements in the RV outflow tract, show decent relations, albeit with some degree of scatter with CMR, uh, RV, and diastolic volumes. This is an uh, example of how to do the fractional area change. The expectation for the RV is less than that of the LV in terms of what you can think of as an ejection fraction or a fractional area change here. And you can see different uh, performances from 60% to 40% to 20%. Clinically, if you're looking at a case and it is very clear in the extremes, you're okay. If you're looking in middle zones, Particularly if you are able to see the endocardium of the RV, it's a good idea to try and do a fractional area change. So you don't need to do it in each and every case. Compared to other indices that you will see, this relates best with the ejection fraction of the RV by CMR. So now, instead of the direct measurements of volumes or volume surrogates, in, i.e. RV areas, let us look at other indices that can tell us the RV systolic performance. So similar to the DPDT that you may have heard about when we talked about MR, you can do the same for the TR. The idea is that the rise in the velocity is related to how fast the RV systolic pressure rises. And a ventricle that contracts well has a faster rise or ha faster rate of increase in its systolic pressure. Granted, this is velocity. And granted, it is looking at pressure gradient, not just RV systolic pressure. Probably not worth doing in day-to-day. -day. Again, I would say use it more qualitatively as opposed to quantitatively doing these measurements. You fix the DP, so you're looking at two velocities, and then one meter per second corresponding to four millimeter mercury and two meters per second corresponding to 16 millimeters mercury. So now you're you have your, your numerator fixed, and all you have to do is figure the time interval between these two points. This is, can be challenging, and you obviously want faster sweep speeds, not slower sweep speeds when you do these measurements. Another index is the ISO, is the TAE index, or myocardial performance index. It takes the position or the thought process that 
how much time is spent in ejection. If this is an efficient time, it spends relatively more time in ejection and less time preparing to eject or recovering from ejection. So we measure the ejection time in relation to total time interval between the, open, between the closure and the opening of the tricuspid valve, i.e. isovolumic contraction time, isovolumic relaxation time, and this ejection time. The, the higher the ratio of the ejection time to this total time interval, the better the performance. You can acquire it by continuous wave Doppler and RV outflow tracks, so now we're looking at different cardiac cycles, or by tissue Doppler, and here you are measuring the ejection time as shown from the ejection velocity and the time interval of isovolumic contraction and isovolumic relaxation. They are not the same as you would guess or expect. They have different values. These tend to be longer or higher, and we'll show you examples. The main problem of the myocardial performance index, any time interval depends on the heart rate, depends on rhythm, and it is not a pure index of contractility because isovolumic relaxation time is related to RV diastolic pressures and RA pressure. TAPSI is very famous, and we do it routinely, and we want to report it routinely in cases with RV dysfunction or suspicious RV dysfunction, pulmonary embolism, patients with cardiomyopathy, advanced heart failures, LVADs, etc. cetera. Uh, TAPSI can also be assessed visually. Obviously, you have the mode and you can do it, and this is the proper way of going about it. But as you are reading a study, look at the vertical motion of the tricuspid annulus. The more the motion, the better the longer axis of the ventricle. Turns out the motion here is not necessarily equal to contractility because it, there is also another motion that happens for the whole heart, which is rotation. And depending on the direction of rotation, you may have cases where there is true RV systolic dysfunction, but an apparently normal TAPSI. We can also measure the systolic ejection velocity, and if I don't have an M mode that I like, then I can do the time velocity integral of that velocity. Velocity times time is the distance that will tell me how much of the annulus is descending. What we use is spectral Doppler, though you can do it with color-coded tissue Doppler. In the earlier times when we were looking at dyssynchrony and interested in these and comparing uh, different segments in the same cardiac cycle, that was the approach used, but not for this objective. Strain is now available on some systems. You have to use the LV. There are some vendors where, you, where they have dedicated software package for RV strain. Here it shows its validation in animals against sonomicrometry with wonderful results. There are also some data showing, not some, several data now with large series of patients showing that RV free wall strain or total strain that gets the whole ventricle relates to outcome. Pulmonary hypertension, uh, the definition of pulmonary hypertension is based on the mean PA pressure, not the PA systolic pressure, so it's more than 25. If we want to label someone with pulmonary arterial hypertension or groups one and three pulmonary arterial hypertension, then that has to be pulmonary hypertension unaccounted for by a rise in left atrial pressure or LV diastolic pressures, preferably the wedge, pre the end diastolic pressure, and of course an increase in the pulmonary vascular resistance. So if we get a case and the challenge for us is can we sort of provide that information even though I'm not able to provide it numerically, you will see that yes, we can come close and sometimes give estimates and assessments that are reasonable. So by echo, we can do PA systolic, PA diastolic, mean PA pressure. We can address the etiology issue. For example, if you see a patient with bad mitral stenosis, we had a case this morning, and very high PA systolic pressure and severe mitral stenosis, this is most likely group two pulmonary hypertension. Notwithstanding, some of these patients can have also a vascular component later on, and it is not unreasonable with pretty high PA pressures to do a right heart cath and look at the response to vasodilators. RV and RA function, RA volume and RV function, and also the presence of effusion are important data that patients, uh, that physicians who take care of these patients look after because they determine outcome. 
and can be related also to what happens in response to treatment. Going back to the question, are we looking at someone with pulmonary hypertension due to, say, uh, pulmonary embolism or someone with pulmonary hypertension due to a high left atrial pressure? The challenge is not necessarily mitral stenosis. It's that group of patients, older individuals, where they carry the possibility or the, the perception that they have heart failure preserved EF. Here, looking at annular velocities is very useful. If it is true pulmonary arterial hypertension, say, you will have a reduced E to A ratio, usually very small TVIs because the LV doesn't get that much filling. In part, the RV is dilated in an advanced stage, and in part, not much blood goes through that pulmonary circulation with very high PA pressures. The annular velocities at the septum is reduced. This is a motion that is in part determined by the RV, but the lateral annulus has normal motion. So if you're looking at this set of data together, you can say this is likely group one, not group two. This is the situation in group two, someone with, say, half PEF. An E to A ratio more than one, that's what we call a pseudo-normal filling pattern. Look at the septal and the lateral velocities, both are reduced. We are assuming that we are having good alignments here and the technical issues with improper alignments leading to spuriously low values is not in play. I bring up this point because as we acquire and as we analyze studies, we have to be careful and scrutinize carefully the signals that we get. How do we get PA systolic pressure? We get PA systolic pressure by tricuspid regurg from multiple windows. You can use agitated saline if needed. The good news is someone with true pulmonary hypertension, there is a high feasibility of getting PA pressures using the TR jet. And at the end, everything should fit together. So if you look at a study where there is evidence of pulmonary hypertension with a flat interventricular septum, systole, and diastole, and you see a TR velocity of 2.5, something is wrong. And you have to go back and reevaluate which of the signals you trust. That's a jet that is incomplete, wouldn't use it. This is a jet which is complete, and we can get the 4V squared modified Bernoulli as you heard before. But even if I say RAP is zero, PA systolic pressure is up. How about PA diastolic pressure? We depend on that on the pulmonary regurgitation signal. We get it from multiple windows. We can use saline. Yield of PR is lower than the yield of TR. But again, in pulmonary hypertension, the yield is much higher, up to 70%. The velocity you are interested in is this end diastolic velocity. And we do the 4V squared and say this is the difference between the PA diastolic pressure and the RAP. So if I get the 4V squared, add to it an estimate of RAP, then I have an estimate of PA diastolic pressure. If you're looking at a velocity of 2, it's already 16, and the PA diastolic pressure is elevated. Where it becomes more uh, challenging and challenging in the sense there can be bigger errors, when you have end diastolic velocities that are, say, 1 or 1 1.5 meter per second, here you're looking at end diastolic gradients between 4 and 9. So whether someone ends up with pulmonary hypertension, elevated PA diastolic, now depends heavily on what estimate you give to RAP. Mean PA pressure, this is what we are after. When we report PA pressures, if we can say what is the mean PA pressure, that's what would be most useful for someone to establish a diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension. So similar to mean PA, mean systolic arterial pressure, it's the diastolic plus one third pulse. So I need to get systolic and diastolic pressures. You can quickly see that you need at least three set of measurements or three estimates the PR and diastolic, the TR peak systolic, and an estimate of RAP. So each of these comes with its own errors, and therefore there can be some discrepancies. One step closer to making less errors is if you depend on one or at most two measurements. And here the mean PA pressure can come into play, being estimated from the PR peak velocity. I'll show you an example of that. 
Another tool to evaluate for pulmonary hypertension is RV outflow. The signal that you get by pulse wave Doppler in the RV outflow, if it accelerates fast, and by fast we are talking less than 100 milliseconds, then that is usually associated with elevated mean PA pressure. Problem time intervals are dependent on RR intervals, rhythms. There are variations with age as well, particularly if you take it to the pediatric population. Also, mean pressures and systolic pressures are related mathematically, and so if I know the systolic pressure, I can derive the mean PA pressure from it. The last one is a regression equation that has been validated in several multi-center reports. I say reports because they were retrospective studies that showed that they relate reasonably well with mean PA pressure by cath. This is the application for the peak pressure, so we do 4V squared, and now I know the mean pressure in this particular case is 46. That's a solid cold. There is significant degree of pulmonary hypertension, even without saying what the RA pressure is. Pulmonary vascular resistance is this last piece of the balance, and here we want resistance in general is pressure overflow. So if I am able to get the mean PA pressure and I'm able to get the surrogate for or the actual estimate of an LAP, then I can get the numerator. To simplify things, Dr. Schiller and his group said, no, we will just look at the peak TR velocity. So that is our surrogate for the pressure. And then for flow, we will look at the time velocity integral of the RV outflow tract. As you can see, there are many simplifications here. First, it is just PA systolic. It is not the mean, and the actual expression to calculate vascular resistance is mean PA pressure minus mean LAP. There is no assessment for what that pressure is, the LAP that is. Flow is not simply RV outflow track TVI. You need the diameter as well. Anyway, its simplicity uh, was still useful in that some studies that correlated it against pulmonary vascular resistance by cath showed that a value that is more than 0.38 is virtually specific for a PVR more than eight wood units. Now, eight wood units is a lot of pulmonary vascular resistance. So if I'm waiting to just estimate eight or above, I would have missed much more serious levels. 0.12 to 0.15 or less goes with normal pulmonary vascular resistance. Interestingly, more than 0.15 was predictive of, hus of hospitalizations for heart failure and uh, all cause mortality in 179 five patients with CAD in the heart and soul study. I believe when he gave grand rounds, Dr. Schiller talked some about that study, so we'll not go in details. RA pressure, we assess it by IVC and how much it collapses. This is complete collapse. This is no collapse and dilated, so normal increased. The more collapse, the lower the mean RAP. The less the collapse, the higher RAP. Open circles are shown, are taken from patients not on mechanical ventilators. The solid circles are taken from patients on mechanical uh, ventilators and, sorry, it's the reverse. The solid ones are those who are not on ventilators. The open ones are those on a ventilator. And if you keep your eye on the open circles, all of these show like a white scatter plot. So collapse index not accurate in someone on mechanical ventilation. And that's one of the limitations for using the IVC to estimate RA pressure. And of course, you need subcoastal views. If you don't have good subcoastal views, you don't show the IVC well, you cannot use it. You can look at tricuspid and flow, and you can look at uh, hepatic venous flow. And similar to mitral and flow, all the principles that you heard about mitral and pulmonary vein flow apply here. Higher E to A ratio, short D cell time in diseased heart mean high RAP a lower systolic to diastolic ratio and a diseased RV in an older individual in particular are consistent with elevated mean RA pressure. That atrial reversal signal, similar to the atrial reversal signal you get in the pulmonary veins, higher value, longer duration goes with elevated RV EDP. These are examples showing E to A ratio, lower and then high value, not a clean Doppler spectral envelope though, E to A ratio directly related, so you can see white scatter. 
predominant systolic flow, usually RAP zero to five equal systolic equal to diastolic about five to 10. And that shows the significant inverse relation in 35 patients between what we call the systolic filling fraction, be it you use the systolic velocity or the time velocity integral. That's a very strong, large atrial reversal that is seen taken from a patient with a RV diastolic dysfunction, high RV EDP in the setting of pulmonary hypertension. Systolic reversal in hepatic veins, a frequent cause for it, not the only causes TR, so that's another good tool for us to look at it. Hepatic veins have their own limitations in patients with pericardial disease, tricuspid valve disease, rhythm disorders, uh, heart transplant recipients, and when you do not have subcostal views. Tissue Doppler has been used. We talked about the isovolumic uh, relaxation time to calculate the myocardial performance index. This time interval also relates to mean RAP. The higher the mean RAP, the shorter the isovolumic relaxation time. E prime is an indicator of RV diastolic function. And similar to the E to E prime ratio on the left side, you have an E to E prime ratio on the right side. This is data from this lab. This is data from Japan looking at a group of patients with pulmonary hypertension and showing pretty decent correlations. Notice an R squared of 0.64 here. So they accounted for 64% of the variance of the RAP with this E to E prime ratio. And more importantly, outcome nicely predicted Individuals with a ratio more than 6.8 had much higher event rate. Uh, limitations, again, pericardial disease, tricuspid valve disease, arrhythmias, if you don't have good signals, that's a summary. I'll skip through it for the sake of time, and I'll stop after this slide. So this is if you want to sort of take home message, some indices or some numbers that you want to remember. The TAPSI is a 1.6, 1.7 centimeters, according to the 2015 guidelines. S prime velocity somewhere between nine and 10 centimeters per second if you're looking at short, easy measurements to do quickly. Basal diameter more than 4.2, I'd say 3.9 to four is more like it. And again, this is dependent on the size of the patient. Uh, subcostal view is what you use to get wall thickness and a wall thickness that, are, that is abnormal for the RV is one that exceeds 0.5 centimeters. Fractional area change less than 35% is what denotes RV dysfunction. I believe by CMR, the cutoff is like a 45 EF for the RV. Okay, so f depends on age and gender. If you are older, we'll hear maybe your RV gets weak. Okay. <laughs> we'll see. For us, neither LV nor RV function are expected to vary with age, nor do indices of systolic function vary with age. It's only indices of diastolic function. Yes, you, you go, for example, if you're talking about, you see the valve and below the valve, that's where you will do the diameter. Below the valve, meaning if I'm traveling from the RV to the valve, the portion of the RV outflow track just below the valve is where I get it, so subvalvular. Okay, the this is a challenging thing to see. Sometimes you can put color to help you see it better, and you can play it back and forth. There are other views that can also show you the RV outflow track that we showed in some short axis views. Some sonographers do them, perhaps those that do more congenital lesions are accustomed to them than others. Thank you, Dr. Naga. And as, and as uh, uh, Dr. Naga pointed out, there's quite a number of uh, parameters and uh, things that can be measured with echo. And in most, uh, most uh, centers, uh, echo is, is usually the first and, and maybe the only uh, modality with which uh, we can uh, assess and, 
and comment on the uh, R, uh, RV in, in general. So um, it's a very, very important uh, um, area to know um, uh, for everyone here. But uh, in centers that are capable of it, uh, R, uh, CMR is actually considered a, um, a good supplement to, to what can be achieved by ECHO. So just a bit of disclosures, I will be, uh, for at least one case, talking about the off-label use of gadolinium, uh, gadolinium for, um, um, for uh, delayed enhancement. And so the critical question I'd like to start uh, with you guys is uh, why, why even bother with cardiac MRI? I mean, even with echo, we can see quite a bit. Uh, uh, so why even bother with cardiac MRI? Um, well, it used to be that uh, ECHO being a, mainly a 2D technology in the past uh, wasn't, e wasn't recommended for, uh, for estimating um, RV function, uh, RV systolic function, that is, RV ejection fractions. Um, that being said, uh, things are catching up on the ECHO side. Um, uh, there are now 3D techniques capable uh, that, that are coming out with, uh, with ECHO. And so uh, uh, the latest chamber guidelines back in 2015 for, for um, in the American Society of ECHO uh, did comment that uh, 3D ECHO uh, uh, may be considered, but uh, the, um, there needs to be further val uh, research and validation uh, done with that. But in terms of CMR, uh, we do have uh, quite a few num uh, added advantage. We do have a large field of view, so we can see everything inside and around the heart. We have unlimited imaging plane. So uh, as Dr. Naga uh, mentioned, um, the RV does have a not so uh, straightforward uh, um, geometric structure. It's pyramidal. And so uh, many different uh, cuts are often needed, but uh, CMR allows us to achieve that. We also have superior image resolution, so you can see uh, great, great detail with, uh, with great contrast to noise ratio. And, and we can also do tissue characterization. Uh, characterization. We can look at fibrosis, inflammation, uh, look at uh, scar, fat, and even the presence of thrombus within the chambers. And uh, uh, last but certainly not least, the greatest strength of CMR is the ability to do, to do uh, quantification. Um, and it has a very high uh, reproducibility, which I will uh, later show the data on. So how do we do it? Those of you who rotated through the cardiac MRI lab uh, know that we start off with localizers that uh, give us a standard transverse cut through the heart. Off of that, we get a, a pseudo-2 and a pseudo-4, and then get uh, a stack of uh, uh, short axes uh, perpendicular to the, um, the pseudo-2 and pseudo-4 uh, long axis. This allows us to see the entire heart um, on short axis, and thus we can begin plotting out um, views for the um, left and right ventricles off of these. For LV acquisition, um, it's pretty straightforward. Hopefully, all of this is uh, familiar to everyone who's uh, done cardiac imaging. Uh, we can achieve a, a conventional four chamber, three chamber, and two chamber that are uh, seen with echo. But in addition, by sliding a little uh, to the right, uh, we can get uh, um, the RP3 chamber. And this is a view that's uh, mainly achievable with a CMR and uh, CMR CT. And we can also get RVOT views. We can also get RV2 chamber views um, as well to, to get uh, for full characterizations of the different um, um, RV views that uh, Dr. Naga mentioned on uh, with ECHO, but in more detail with CMR. OK. Looks like it's going to think or crash. So. What can we tell off of, of CMR uh, straight off the bat? We can tell uh, qualitatively quite a few things, actually. Uh, we can see, of course, if the RV is, uh, quote, normal size relative to LV. Um, the RV is, is usually uh, uh, diameter-wise less than the um, LV, uh, less than 2 thirds, as, uh, on, as shown here. And just to play this, it will play. guess it won't. Um, but uh, we can also see whether or not the RV has severe dysfunction and if this will play, uh, which I'm guessing it won't. Um, you'll, you'll see that uh, there are all the parameters that Dr. Naga mentioned with like uh, diminished TAPSI and diminished uh, uh, wall motion. Of course, we can also visually see if the uh, RV is severely dilated, as can be seen here, uh, where, where um, there's apical dominance uh, on, on the four chamber view, as well as uh, a, a very large diameter as well. We can also see the RV uh, wall thickness, and shown here is a good example of RV hypertrophy, where you can clearly see uh, the RV uh, wall is, is actually almost as thick as the LV. And, um, and of course, there's uh, um, other findings that are suggestive of increased pulmonary pressures. 
We can also uh, do, uh, as part of our protocol, we give contrast to everyone. And so we actually give them um, an arterial phase uh, as shown on this view here. And I guess the computer's gonna think about it. Um, but basically uh, what we can comment on is whether or not uh, there's contrast reflux in the, uh, in the hepatic veins. And this is the equi equivalent of systolic, uh, uh, systolic hepatic venous reversal seen, seen on echo. So when we see that, that's, a, that's either a sign that there's significant uh, tricuspid regurgitation, tricuspid valve regurgitation, or, or um, increased uh, RA pressure suggesting uh, uh, that there's, that there's uh, uh, something wrong with the RV filling pressures as well. Um, Dr. Naga already um, uh, mentioned the echo uh, uh, dis uh, coronary distributions, and so I won't belabor that. We do have a, a convention in our CMR report of reporting different wall segments. Of course, this is uh, unique to Webpacks, um, uh, and uh, we'll still need some further validation for that. And in terms of volumes, um, just as you expect with the LV uh, going, going through uh, methods of disks, what we can do on uh, CMR is by taking the tomographic slices uh, through the LV and RV, we can um, get, uh, get the uh, cross-sectional area on each short axis at end diastole and end systole, uh, multiply it by a known thickness and get a, a volume for each. We make no geometric assumptions here, so there's no assumption that this is supposed to be some kind of ellipse or some uh, or a circle or any other shape. And so we can trace this and, and send this up to get uh, uh, true end diastolic volume and end systolic volume, quantify our RV stroke volume and ejection fractions accordingly. We have a confirmatory evidence um, as well with the flows. We can actually do uh, pulmonary artery flows as well. And so this gives us uh, an idea of, of how much stroke volume there should at least be going through, um, being pumped out of the RV uh, as well, assuming no significant PI and uh, no, um, significant uh, TR as well. Okay. Um, and this has been well validated in, um, in, in, in various studies, uh, looking at cadaver hearts, looking at uh, um, 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 uh, flow calculations with, uh, with, with CATH and also looking at uh, uh, comparing it, uh, uh, as, as seeing its reproducibility in comparison with ECHO. And so what, I, what can be concluded is that based on all these uh, studies that there's a great intra-observer, great intra-observer and low intra-study uh, uh, variability. Uh, so this is, this is important because when you wanna do serial assessments in these patients, especially uh, pulmonary hypertension patients or congenital patients, um, you want to be able to make sure your methods are re reproducible as well. Okay. And um, Dr. Nage did mention about uh, reference values. Uh, if we take, uh, if we take um, all comers, the 95% confidence intervals for RVEF is actually much higher. It's between 54 and 78%, as can be seen here. And it's actually diff uh, it's not too different between uh, men and women. But uh, there is a, a trend that's uh, been, uh, been noticed in various epidemiologic studies. This is from uh, Dr. Macera and her, and her work in and, and the United Kingdom. Uh, and she showed that in, um, in, in men and women that as we get older, uh, there's actually a gradual decrease in, in uh, RV chamber sizes and a corresponding increase in RV ejection fraction sizes. So um, that's why when we uh, do our assessments in, in the CMR lab, we actually uh, index it both to BSA and also by age and gender. This is built into our, our reports and we provide 95% uh, confidence intervals um, uh, for that particular patient. Okay. But um, you, I mentioned that we trace it on short axis. What about doing it on long axis? And uh, it turns out uh, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Clark and, and others have investigated this uh, a while back, and they actually found that this is actually fairly comparable. You, that one, you can do it, and then two, that when you compare it with, uh, with a phase contrast imaging, the method of looking at flows um, for validation, that axial contours and short axis uh, contours are actually in, in pretty good agreement. And shown here, you can see there's a correlation of uh, about um, uh, 0.84 for axial tracings and 0.81 for short axis tracings with the confidence intervals that uh, roughly overlap. So why would we do one over another? I do argue that, uh, at least for this, for um, uh, the case of Epstein's uh, anomalies where the tricuspid valve uh, is more apically displaced, um, especially the septal leaflet, that the axial uh, tracings are, are much better for, for those uh, situations. And so uh, there is a role for, for doing axial cuts uh, in that situation. Um, but 
In terms of assessing congenital heart disease, uh, this is fresh from last summer. Uh, the ACCHA uh, Adult Congenital Writing Group uh, released uh, different guidelines, and so they graduated from just simply saying tetra tetralogy of Fallot uh, is an appropriate er area for assessing RP size and function. They now broadened it uh, as a class 1B indication for all adult, adult congenital heart disease, um, stating that uh, uh, um, RV assessment is reasonable in those who are at risk for developing RV remodeling. Uh, of course, they also mention, uh, give special mention of Epstein's and uh, um, congenitally corrected uh, transposition um, uh, cases as well for, for assessing our, um, uh, RV function as, um, and sizes as well. Okay. In terms of reproducibility of the, uh, uh, of the RV um, in terms of size and function, it's actually uh, pretty good. And shown here are are uh, different studies that have uh, look, looked at the uh, reproducibility. These are sh uh, shown on the left are the early studies before uh, they uh, um, did further validation. But um, in, in terms of uh, in terms of, uh, in, of uh, reproducibility, it, it's actually it's actually improved now. So uh, uh, RVEF wise, this, the variability uh, between uh, between uh, um, uh, uh, readers and uh, inter, uh, repeat studies is actually is actually pretty good. Okay. So then the next question um, that needs to be answered is, well, why do all this? Why do we even even care? And so for that, I like to go through a, a couple of cases and um, hopefully get some audience uh, participation. Okay. So I'm going to start off with a 66 year old uh, male who was admitted with chest pain, and. I get the feeling it's going to have cleared it, but let's take a look. Oops. So for the cardiac MRI uh, fellows, um, what do you guys see here? And, and just for uh, the audience, uh, the top row shows cines with short axis on the first row and long axis uh, sh shown on the second. Um, this is just anatomic cuts through, and shown on these images here are uh, delayed enhancements. Um, so I heard a dilated RV. Sure. So a diaphragmatic segment of the uh, RV, LV, or both. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes, Dr. Naga picked up on the turbulence, yes, on the four chamber. <laughs> that, that, is, that is true. So there is central TR, secondary TR, but as uh, uh, Dr. Shaw has been pointing out, uh, there's actually quite a bit of uh, hypokinesis, even possibly akinesis along the, uh, along the lateral, lateral RV free wall. Okay. Um, on, Yeah, so this is a very excellent case of an RV, uh, RV infarct picked up on, on cardiac MRI. So um, as one would expect uh, in the RCA distribution, there is, uh, there, there is infraroceptal uh, um, uh, delayed enhancements with corresponding wall motions um, that was seen earlier in the cine. It's more evident in the, in the apical segments. And um, as Rusha pointed out, there's quite a, um, quite a bit of en enhancement in the RV lateral wall here. So this is a case of an RV infarct. And so the triad that usually shows up um, in, in these cases is, uh, let's see if I can get this playing again. Uh, it, the, the triad of jugular venous distension, um, hypotension, and uh, clear clear um, breath sounds. Uh, it, let's see, it uh, is uh, the typical presentation of an RV infarct. So let's see, where is this? Okay. 
This is just il uh, this is just illustrating the salient findings with the with the presence of delayed enhancement. And um, and as I mentioned, there's a triad of uh, um, of these three uh, uh, presentations. Um, and the incidence of RVMI in the context of inferior MI is, is, pretty, is, uh, is pretty frequent, but hemodynamically significant uh, uh, presentations are, are, are pretty low. But if RV infarct is detected, um, this does uh, um, portend a, a, worse, uh, um, a worse prognosis uh, overall. And this is data showing, showing that if RVMI is, is detected, uh, uh, that you tend to have a um, that, that you do tend to have uh, 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 changes uh, on the uh, on the LV um, LV and RV side as well. Okay. This is a meta analysis showing what happens if RV infarct uh, does show up. Um, that there is uh, increased mortality, um, as one would expect. Cardiogenic shock would would present as well, and because of the fibrotic nature of the tissue, there's uh, uh, there's going to be VT and v VF as well, and. Um, uh, the likelihood of advanced AV block. This is this is stuff we would already know from from a clinical presentation. Okay. Another frequent referral for the cardiac MRI lab is, um, of course, uh, um, patient young patients who come in with sudden cardiac death, and uh, I think you know where this is going. Let's see. So let me go to the second case, and shown here again are cines on top. And on the third row, okay. On the third row, uh, we do a, a four-chamber stack. And the four-chamber stack allows us to look at the RV more of uh, 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 lateral wall more carefully. And what I want to draw your attention to is on the short axis stacks, you'll actually see that there's areas in the anterior portion, which don't move as well. And it's also, and it's also present on, um, on the more um, superior views of the four-chamber stack as well. Okay. And of course, delayed enhancement is shown here, and there's not much to comment on. Um, in fact, uh, one criteria that often comes up is a fibro fatty infiltrate, um, but that's uh, not, not uh, as uh, not as uh, clear on this on this particular case, uh, but basically this is a case of uh, um, ARVC, arrhythmogenic uh, RV cardiomyopathy, and uh, and in terms of a uh, um, task force criteria, CMR criteria have limited it only to to uh, uh, a couple major things. One is that regional or uh, regional RV akinesia or dyskinesia must be present. And, uh, uh, and uh, one of the following, either the RV is dilated, um, 110 per, uh, milliliters per meter squared in men, uh, or greater than 90 millimeters uh, per meter squared in women, um, or uh, RV ejection fraction uh, less than uh, 40%. So these are uh, major criteria that are necessary for diagnosis for ARVC, um, CMR, uh, CMR criteria-wise. Of course, uh, keep in mind that this is uh, that you would also have to add up the clinical history, EKG findings, uh, and everything else, um, and have a combination of major criteria and minor criteria to make the diagnosis. Okay. Uh, another thing that often comes up is a, a, a patient. Uh, a patient comes in and um, they were told they have a, a large, enlarged uh, um, chambers of the heart, and so this is actually a volunteer who participated in. Uh, uh, in a in a um, in a uh, practice study, and this and just to show you the case uh, example, one thing that will immediately strike you is how much bigger the the uh, heart uh, looks relative to the rest of the body. I guess it's going to take some time to load. 
But the bottom line is um, with, art, with uh, athlete's heart, there is an expected uh, corresponding chamber enlargement. Um, and that's been shown in, in exercise uh, studies uh, as well. Um, in fact, uh, there's usually a disproportionate RV uh, enlargement compared to LV, uh, LV enlargement as well. And there's also a, a lower ejection fraction uh, measured, um, uh, measured in the RV uh, compared to LV uh, as well. Um, shown here are, uh, are, uh, are uh, different quintiles of physical activity, and this uh, shows that as you uh, have more and more fitness, more physical activity, uh, again, the, the RV size enlarges, particularly the EDV. Uh, ESV also uh, enlarges as well, and the ejection fraction roughly stays the same um, overall. This is aerobic activity. Correct. Um, but what about uh, what would distinguish this from uh, pathologic remodeling of the uh, uh, heart uh, ARVC patients? And in the case of ARVC, uh, uh, what uh, ARVC patients that have that uh, athletes do not is uh, wall motion abnormalities, delayed enhancement, uh, and also potential LV involvement as well. Okay. Any questions? And I. Uh, and what about uh, fibrosis? Um, there was a, a, a study where they looked at an a, uh, athletic populations, and they did find that um, despite, uh, dis, despite uh, these being uh, fairly fit individuals, that there was um, the presence of fibrosis for, for whatever reason. And so um, what exactly um, it is in a, a, in a large number of cases, like uh, um, the majority is uh, nonspecific. So they're not exactly sure why, but it can develop. Now these are percent of individuals with fibrosis. Correct. What is the average percent of fibrosis in the people that have that disorder? Is it like less than 5% usually? Or is it uh, can be larger? That's a good question. Uh, from what I've seen in the case literature, it can vary all over the place depending on what's studied. We've had an yeah. individual who served with, with this, who was an athlete, but there were concerns about a cardiomyopathy. CMR showed fibrosis, I think, somewhere around 3 to 5%. Yes, and unfortunately, it's not specific. And it you can be in yes. any place, no. not the RV septal insertion site. Is that right? That's yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, this one's a nice old um, oldie. Uh, hopefully, this is familiar with everyone. Once I show these images, so this is a. Um, uh, a middle-aged uh, uh, person presenting with uh, with a history of liver cancer, who presents with this, and um, it should be quite uh, evident on these views. Um, I'm sure Dr. Naga, Naga will definitely notice the uh, tricuspid lesion in this in this uh, particular case. Um, but this is how uh, uh, carcinoid syndrome would uh, would would uh, show up on on CMR. So, needs to say this this uh, lady had torrential uh, TR due to due to uh, fixed leaflets. Now, in terms of assessing, uh, assessing valvular regurgitation, we typically do uh, RV stroke volume minus PA systolic flow. Um, that's how we how we assess it uh, on CMR. Um, in terms of a novel technique, um, there was one group in the University of Chicago that published on uh, creating a equivalent of a vena contracta. So um, that that did come out uh, a couple of years ago, where, uh, where they were able to uh, uh, measure measure the ER EROA uh, on this as well. Um, but the reproducibility of this, this would need further validation and, 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 and studies at other centers uh, before this can be, uh, be used in, in prime time. So this is being a contract by CMR? Yes, using a 2D phase contrast. Okay. With that, I, I, I like to conclude. I, I do have a couple more cases, but uh, in the interest of time, I, I know um, we all would like to move on. Let's see. But uh, um, another application, of course, is adult congenital heart disease. Um, clearly, as the RV progressively gets gets worse, um, the the window for intervening upon these patients uh, gets gets worse as well. Um, there are there is uh, uh, there are uh, talks of trying to use septal geometry to try to measure pulmonary pressures, but that wouldn't be specific to CMR. That would also be uh, be something that could be done on the echo 
uh, echo site as well. Uh, of course, everyone talks about uh, T1 mapping. There is a potential for 3D T1 mapping techniques uh, um, uh, uh, using CMR. Now, there's an AGI sequence that's used at the University of Virginia by Dr. Kramer and company. Uh, and of course, there's a, a possibility of using, doing 3D full volume CNAs. Currently, we're still doing 2D acquisitions, uh, but uh, hopefully down the road, we can uh, begin doing 3D volumes with uh, compressed sensing. RV strain is also being actively explored. Um, so, uh, so a few groups are beginning to look at that as well using feature tracking methods. And of, and of course, uh, uh, 4D flow is uh, on the horizon trying to look at uh, flow characteristics. So just to summarize, CMR does provide excellent vis visualization of the RV and accurate assessment of volumes and function. It has low variability and is helpful for serial measurements. It does permit the assessment of RV myocardial infarction and new techniques are being actively uh, pursued to try to to improve um, what uh, CMR can add, uh, add to patients. Thank you. Thank you.